We are on part 39 of Understanding the Kingdom, and we've got some great things to get into today, and uh, I was telling Michael this morning that I'm having a hard time not wanting to preach what I'm beginning to write. God's showing some really neat things on how the, when Elijah was at Mount Carmel, how it parallels the things that he did to prepare for the fire of God, literally parallels to what Jesus did. It was his three and a half years of ministry that prepared them for the day of Pentecost. Uh, some really neat things, but I, I want to go into Acts chapter 2. In fact, I want to look at some things and really set it back into historical context. You know, we have a lot of things that go on in the body of Christ and a lot of teachings that are being taught. When you bring one verse out of, out of context and you don't put it back into the dynamic of what's not only happening within the setting and the people, you can develop a lot of things. How many know Acts 2.38 is not a secret sauce on how to get saved? And if you pull it out of everything else that's going on, you miss the entire point of what is going on. And so I want to put it back into context today, and I want to pick up with verse 37 of Acts chapter 2. And you know, here it is, because I'm going to be going back to Peter's, Peter's message here in a little bit. But Peter preaches his first message on the day of Pentecost. And to pick up in verse 47, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off. Okay, so there's different groups here. To you and to your children, to Israel. Those that are far off not only deal with Ephraim, but deal with all the Gentiles that were far off. How many glad that Peter put that in? He was prophesying things that he didn't even understand because, because he was under the anointing. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now we need to set this back into context into the entire ministry of Jesus. Jesus was very succinct in saying, I say nothing unless I hear the Father say it. I do nothing unless I, unless I see the Father doing it. That, that's essential. Because that was a mark, that was, that was the major uh, mark of him being the Messiah. So I want to go to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 19. And this, this is Moses teaching about Messiah when he comes. And you know what, what's phenomenal when you really understand who Jesus is? You know, Moses said, there's going to be one coming like me. We call Moses the lawgiver. No, he wasn't. He was the law dictator. He dictated, the, the word was dictated to him. He was the secretary of God. The lawgiver was Jesus. And he, and he hung around so much with Jesus, which is Yahweh of the Old Testament, that he began to be uh, a symbol of uh, this is what it means to walk with Yahweh. This, and, and the words that he spoke were the words that only Yahweh gave him. And so he said, listen, there's one coming that's going to be, you're going to identify him because he's going to remind you of me. That Jesus was, was not only giving them the law, he was showing them what he intended with it when he gave it to Moses. Kind of a neat idea. It's like the author saying, no, 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 you guys in the last thousand, couple thousand years, you've really messed it up. And he came and he lived it the right way. So let's pick up here in verse 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren like unto me, unto him shall ye hearken, according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Herob, in the day of the assembly, saying, Let us not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let us see this great fire any more, that we do not die. And the Lord said unto me, Thou hast well spoken that they, what, what they have spoken. I will raise up a prophet from among the brethren, listen to this, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth. Isn't that what Jesus said? I say nothing unless the Father says for me to say it. I will put the words in his, in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him, and it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words which I speak, which he will speak in my name, I will require it of him. So we have, we have Peter connecting that 
two in the so on the day of Pentecost. Now this is forty days after the resurrection of Jesus. And why was Jesus resurrected? Because they rejected the one that God raised up among their brethren that was likened to Moses, that he was speaking only the word of God. They rejected God's voice in him, and they crucified the one that Moses warned them about. You better do what he says. And that was the brunt of Peter's message, as well as when, when Almighty God told David, I will not leave thy soul in hell, and all these different things, he was speaking through David about the Messiah, and he was preaching the resurrection. So, you killed him, God resurrected him, he's now seated at the right hand, and he's waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool, and which side are you on? Are you now an enemy because you crucified the Lord of glory, or are you going to repent of what you have done and get right with God? And so when his brothers hear this, they're pricked in their hearts, they're convicted, and they say, well, what do we need to do? Does that make sense? Because, and that's the quandary of all mankind. What they did to Jesus is simply another version of what happened in the garden. That Almighty, that Jesus would come down, He is the Olive Tav, He would come down, He is Yahweh manifested in this earth. He came down and fellowshiped with Adam, but Adam rejected His voice and went after the voice of another. The Nechesh in the garden. That, so what Israel did that caused the crucifixion of Christ is what all mankind did at the beginning that introduced sin into the world. So what Peter is beginning to tell them here of what they need to do is not only for the nation of Israel, but it is for all of mankind because all the way going back to the garden, Adam rejected the voice of God. He rejected the instruction of God. And he said, I choose to have another source to hear his voice and to have knowledge. And so all of us need to repent of that. That's why we enter into salvation. Because the one that, Mo that Moses promised that would be the Redeemer came and lived his life and lived his ministry three and a half years, the exact time period that the original Torah cycle was given by Moses. And it lasted in Israel that long until the establishment of the synagogue. When Ezra and Nehemiah established the synagogue, they, and people were assembling Every Sabbath, it would only take a year to go through the cycle. But prior to that, from, from Ezra and Nehemiah all the way to Moses, it was three and a half years because they can only hear the Torah read when they gathered three times a year. So let me know it would take a whole lot longer than hearing the Torah read every week. And so he connects it with this. And he says, listen... Uh, you crucified him, and they, they were pricked at heart. Now, understanding Deuteronomy eighteen nineteen, where it says that um, it says, and it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken to his voice, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. And that's that's old Elizabethan English. The complete Jewish Bible brings this out better. Okay. Whosoever does not listen to my words, which, I, which he will speak in my name, will have to give an account for himself to me. Ouch! Because literally all of mankind one day is going to have to give an account, either at the white throne judgment or the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to have to give an account on whether we responded to the words that Almighty God spoke through Messiah. And how many know the, the last thing you want to do is stand before him? Yeah, you sent him and we crucified him. That's why they were pricked to their hearts. That's why they were so convicted. And that's why we feel the conviction because we feel all the way back to the Garden of Eden when, we, when Adam rejected the voice of God and chose the fire and the voice of another. And man was infused with the sin nature. All of us, when we hear the story of Jesus and what he did for us, we all have got to say, I am guilty 
And therefore, I need to repent because how many times in my life was Almighty God speaking to me even before I was saved? He was speaking, calling me to the kingdom, and I rejected his voice because the voice of the Nechesh was too alluring. It appealed to my carnal nature. I didn't want to respond because once I responded to that voice, I knew I had to live differently. And so... The first thing Peter tells them to do is you need to repent. That is universal. Who set the standard for that? Jesus did. Jesus said his message was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now Peter's message is repent for the kingdom is here. The only way that you can enter into the kingdom of God is through repentance. Without repentance, it is impossible to enter in. That's one of the reasons why today we have so many church members that, that are members of the church, but they're not members of the kingdom because they came in because of an emotional response and there was no repentance. They went and they joined a club, they, jumped, they joined an association, but they did not let the Holy Spirit do His full work to bring them to repentance. And if all of us will remember, that was actually a process, wasn't it? It wasn't an emotional thing during the last five minutes of a sermon because the, the preacher got the lights right and he got the mood right and he told you a sad story about somebody's dog that died and it caused you to be get all emotionally wrapped up. That will not lead to salvation. We have got to be confronted with our sin with how, almighty, that how it has separated us from Almighty God, how that God loved us so much that He sent Jesus for us to pay the wages of those sins, and that when I repent, I can begin receiving what He did for me. And so, literally, Peter, remember Jesus, and now Peter was there and says, you know, I, I give you the keys of the kingdom. Now, He was giving them to all mankind, but Peter had this unique thing that He did. He preached the kingdom for the first time after the resurrection of Messiah to the Jews. Unlocked it. Repentance, you can come in. Then later on in his ministry, he's up on top of a roof and God gives him a vision which people think is about food. It has nothing to do with food whatsoever because in a Jewish mind in that time, Gentiles were just as filthy as pigs and lobsters and everything else unclean. That's why they thought if a Gentile touched me, I'm, I'm, I'm unclean. We see that all throughout the New Testament. And that's the only way God could get it through this thick fisherman's head that Gentiles were going to be made clean by what Messiah did, which he preached on the day of Pentecost and didn't know it. To my brethren, the Jews, and to those that are far off, all the Gentiles. That, that is a universal term used not only for Ephraim that was scattered among the Gentiles, but all the Gentiles. They're afar off. They're without covenant. They're without hope. They're without God. But the gospel is to those that are near and to those that are far off, which also agrees with the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians. And so now he finds himself in Cornelius' home and he preaches the gospel to them. They immediately receive and they're baptized in the Holy Spirit immediately and there's tongues and there's prophecy just like there was on the original day of Pentecost because for the Gentiles, that was their first Pentecost. And God did it that way so that when he went back to Jerusalem, he said, I don't know, God did it and it was just like with us on the first day of Pentecost. Who can argue with that? I don't know about you, but I'm already happy. He, he did that. He opened the keys to the kingdom. So what the, the key is in the hands of the church now. And the only way it can be put into the lock of a sinner is by him repenting to receive the gospel and to repent. And it opens up the kingdom to him. Does that make sense? In fact, what I have found personally is every single person anytime that we go higher in God. I mean, there's precept upon precept, there's line upon line. Paul talks about us going from faith to faith and glory to glory. Every single level in God proceeds with the Holy Spirit showing us things so that we can repent of and get that get Babylon out of our life to go higher in God. There is spiritual displacement. You got to get rid of one to make room for another. 
It's part of the sanctification process. The more that I sanctify myself unto God, because sanctify also means to be cut off. I'm cut off from the world. I get rid of the things of the world so that I can make more room for God. And that is an art that we have lost in the body of Christ. We want to keep all of our carnality and make it to heaven. And it's almost to the place where people are, it's like a contest. Let's see who can get to heaven with most of the world in their pockets. With the most carnality. Let me tell you something. The, the whole contest of the kingdom is to see how little of the world is left in you by the time you get there. In fact, in, in some of the saints that, I, that I've read about, and uh, they said that, that it, the reason that so-and-so went ahead and passed away is they got so full of God that the earth couldn't hold them anymore. John G. Lake or Smith Wigglesworth wrote that about his own wife. That, and when you, when you read his own story, she died while he was on a missions trip. He comes back, stops the train. He resurrects her from the dead on the train after she had already been dead for I don't know how long. They, haven't, they hadn't buried her yet. He resurrects her from the dead. And she's griping at him saying, why would you bring me back? I want to go back. And he realized that she was so full of heaven that the earth couldn't hold her anymore. We need to realize that, that our, the process of sanctification, the more the kingdom I have in me, the less of Babylon there is, there's room for. Which also means the less that Babylon can affect me. It's part of putting on the armor. We want to make sure that we're bulletproof, if you will, as far as the fiery darts of the wicked one. The things the enemy has and the darts that he shoot can only connect to the things that resonate with his kingdom. That'll hit you in a minute. Now we can pull up a shield of faith to come between those, but our task is to so establish the character of God that the missiles the enemy shoots at us has nothing to home into. It makes his job a lot harder. And so there's this repentance going on. Now I want to read Acts 2.38 again, and I want to read it out of the, out of the complete Jewish Bible. Because he brings out this thing of being baptized in the name of Jesus. And I want to show you how it doesn't contradict what Jesus said in Matthew 28. Because one of the things in the Pentecostal movement they say is that Peter had a great, greater revelation than Jesus. Let me tell you something. Nobody had a greater revelation than Jesus. All revelations must be compared back to Jesus, and if they don't agree with the one who only spoke the words that the Father gave him, then it's to be set aside. Okay? So what is he really saying here? A complete Jewish Bible. And, and Kepha answered them, which is Jewish for Peter, Turn from sin, return to God, and, and each one of you be immersed on the authority of Yeshua the Messiah. Now you're going to catch that. They rejected his authority is why he was crucified. Okay. So now you have to be baptized and accept his authority. You see, there's several things that we don't understand 2,000 years later. That there's a history of baptism in the Bible that predates John the Baptist. How many know John the Baptist is not the one who invented baptism? It goes all the way back to Moses. And it wasn't the Red Sea. The Red Sea is about going through the blood. Oh, I tell you what, you can preach about the Red Sea because if you allow the blood of Jesus to cover everything in you, it kills Pharaoh's armies trying to bring you back captive. Oh, I mean, we need an organ about right there. And so he takes the people that were redeemed, freed from Pharaoh, and now they're at Mount Sinai. And, and God tells Moses, you have them go down and they need to mikvah, they need to wash. And mikvah is the root word for baptism in Hebrew. They need to mikvah for three days, 
which is identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But the important part was for them that they washed off. I mean, they, they cleansed and they washed everything so that not even the dust of Egypt remained on them or their clothing or anything that they had. And when that happened, now they were re ready to be a people before God, to come into covenant, to become a nation, and to walk with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so you see this concept of mikvah. If, you, if, we, if we could go back in time to the time of Jesus and walk up to the Temple Mount, archaeologists tell us there were about a thousand baptismal pools all around the Temple Mount because every male, before he would go into the Temple, he would himself mikvah to prepare himself before he went into the Temple. We, you, know, you might call it ceremonial cleansing is one of, the, one of the Levitical terms for it. But when the rabbis look back, at what the people did with Moses, it was submitting to the authority of Moses that they mikvahed, that prepared them to walk with God. And so in the time that you begin developing the rabbis, the school of, of Hillel, the school of Shammai, that whenever you had a young student come in to be a disciple, like when Paul, he was a disciple of Gamaliel. So when he entered into the school of Hillel, he was most likely baptized under the authority of Gamaliel. And it's him saying, Gamaliel is now the one who's going to to teach me. I'm washing off the things of the world and now like Moses I'm going to follow him as he instructs me on how to walk with God. So it was a very common practice. John the Baptist did it as a way of preparing the people for the Lord. Now post Calvary when we're baptized we're doing it in the authority of Messiah saying that as I, that as I go under the water I surrender completely to the headship, the lordship and the authority of Jesus of Nazareth because I recognize that he's the Messiah and I identify with him with his death burial and resurrection and as I come up out of the water the old man has died and now this new man is going to walk with God as I follow the teachings of the lawgiver the one who gave them to Moses that came and walked it perfectly before us three and a half years that's what that baptism means and so did it contradict when Jesus said you will baptize in the name of the Father Son and the Holy Spirit no it doesn't because which one of the Godhead had they rejected? Did they reject the Father when they crucified Jesus? Well, kind of yes and no. Did they reject the Holy Spirit? Well, kind of yes and no. Did they reject Jesus? Absolutely. And so Peter was saying, he was the Messiah. Almighty God warned us that one day we're going to have to stand before the Ancient of Days and give an account before him on how we responded to the one that he put his words in his mouth. And you killed him, and he rose from the dead, and now he's waiting for his enemies to become his footstool. That was kind of the end of his sermon. He's waiting for his enemies to become the, end of the his footstool. And the whole congregation said, uh-oh. <laughs> so what are you going to do? Are you going to repent and come back under his teachings as he came to show us the way? And then be baptized to where he, that he is now your master. He is now your teacher. He is now the one and you're going to surrender completely to his authority. The same way that the centurion surrendered completely to Caesar's authority, that's why he was a man under authority, and he could move in authority. So when baptism is done right, and you understand the dynamic of it, when you come up out of the water, you're in a position of totally yielding to Jesus, and now you come up as a man under authority, or a woman under authority, and you've got to do what he tells you to do. Boy, nobody's told that about water baptism. It's, let's just join the church. No, Bubba, are you sure you want to come up out of that water? Because once you do, you've got to do everything he says. That's how you end up with the three bubble Baptists. <laughs> you sure you want to come up? All of that is so important because it is about kingdom. It is about yielding to the authority of of who Messiah is. If he is king, if he is Lord, you're not. It's not your authority, it's his authority, and you can only move in kingdom to authority to the same proportion that you completely yield to his authority. 
That's why he looked at the centurion and he marveled and said, you know, nobody else gets it, but this Roman gets it. Nobody in Israel gets it, but this Roman gets it. Because everybody else was looking at a way to build their authority. But in the kingdom, the only way to get authority is to relinquish authority and bow your knee before the king. That's it. That's, that's the crux. And then he said, you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. As a member of the kingdom, the Holy Spirit is the agent that causes us to be born again. If the Holy Spirit doesn't come and prick your heart and to convict you, it's impossible for you to get saved. Because you can't do it on your own. It is a sovereign work of God. Now, I'm not getting into Calvinism. This is basic fundamentalism. That the Holy Spirit comes and convicts you. Then you have a choice. Either yield to that conviction. And I, I, I remember in, in the old days, in, in the Baptist days, we had what was called the White Knuckle Club. And if you've ever been under anointed preaching to repentance, you'll have men and women grab the back of the, of the pew in front of them until their knuckles turn white because they're resisting the convicting power of the Holy Spirit and they're refusing to go down and let go of their sins and to yield to completely to Jesus. You see, the only way you get in is you've got to let go of that white knuckle club and learn how to be part of the bended knee club. The Holy Spirit is the agent. He comes on you. He's the agent that causes the new birth. And then he moves on the inside of you. And we, we have a lot of Pentecostals look at that and think that that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's another complete work. As we've already talked about, Jesus after his resurrection, Almighty God once again breathed on, on, on his people. And they became alive spiritually. And he said, receive you the Holy Spirit. He didn't say, receive you the Holy Spirit, but wait 40 days before he gets here. They received the Holy Spirit right then. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is upon. And the only way that you can get the Holy Spirit upon is you better have the Holy Spirit within first. And that's a sign of citizenship. Every citizen of the kingdom has the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them that created the new birth. And I have been all over the world when I was in the military. And I have met people that I could not speak their language and they could not speak my language. But I sense the Holy Spirit on the inside of them. And I sense the kingdom of God on the inside of them. And all we could do is just look at each other and smile because we knew that we had somebody that was a part of the kingdom that's what he was promising here and then after we have that experience how many know every one of us need to seek the face of God for that external mantle that that mantle of ministry to come on us from Jesus sometimes some people get tongues some people don't but what matters is we keep pressing in until I, I tell people you keep pressing in until you glow at night you keep pressing in until, the, until this efficiency to move in the kingdom begins to flow in your life. Now, I want to set this back into New Testament times, and I want to answer a question that we're seeing in the world today. Why was Christianity, New Testament Christianity in the days of Acts, why was it so threatening to Rome? If we'll understand that question, we'll understand why today Christianity, the true religion of peace, the only true religion of peace, why is it so hated in all the earth? Why is it more uh, persecuted than any other religion on the planet? First of all, all the other religions on the planet and all the nations of the earth are under the authority of principalities and powers that fell. They are fallen immortals that ever since the Tower of Babel have been against God and they're the ones that control like there's the prince of, of Persia and, there, and, then, and he was talking and when you read Daniel that one day he'll be removed because the prince of Greece is going to come because there, was the, there is a principality of power over the nation of Greece that one day would, would supersede what the Persians were doing. We see all that. Every nation, there is a principality over America. There's a principality over Canada. There's a principality over Mexico. There's a principality over the different nations of Europe. One of the things I discovered in my research when you look at what the mystery religions are doing, they have basically a temple in every nation with their, with their most 
prized channeler that channels instructions from their principality that then that channeler among the mystery religions gives it to the political leaders of the nation that are in line with the mystery religions on how to govern their nations. And so all the kingdoms of this world are under those that have rebelled against God. And so Rome was an expression of that. You can, you can follow it right down to where you had, you had mystery Babylon, or you have Babylon, you have Greece, you have Rome, and then there's other ones after that. All of them were after, were ruled by these principalities and powers, but in a sense, they're all the same, they're all in the same kingdom. When you look at the mystery religions, although you may have Raja Christians over here, and you have Masons over here, and you have Wiccans over here, and you have whatever uh, division of the Illuminati over here, they are different are tentacles of the same barbaric creature. And the only ones that are not a part of that kingdom are the ones that are a part of the kingdom of God. It is, it is like when Abraham walked out of Babylon, he stuck out like a sore thumb. He refused to walk in those ways and chose to walk with God. And that's what Israel was supposed to be. But today, for what we're seeing, a lot of what's going on in Israel, that they're under a principality just like America and all the rest. And part of what God's going to do is he's going to have to tear off the veneer so that all of us can make our decision. Now I know that's harsh to say, and you know, and, and I pray for the peace of Israel every day. But I tell you what, when you go into Israel and you look at their par the, the parliament that they have, they have this meditation court, and there's a crystal pyramid over the top of it. You know, if, if there was one place in, in, in all the world where you would not find any type of pyramid, I think it would have been in Israel, don't you? It's like, didn't we? leave the pyramids and we walked with God, but yet you'll find one at their main parliament. Because the free, uh, masonry and, and uh, the Sabbatine Kabbalists and so many other things have taken over, but they're, going, they're getting ready to get their comeuppance from Almighty God. Because where are we headed? And th this is where I want to know. know where this thing is headed. Let's go to Revelation chapter 11. You see, it's preparing us against this day. And I'm kind of showing you the end of the series before we actually get to the end of the series. But I'll, in the end, Jesus wins. Okay? Picking up in verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there was, great noise, there was a great voice in the heavens, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. At that very moment... Every kingdom on this planet was yanked out of the hands of every principality and power. It was yanked out of the hands of the mystery religions. It was yanked out of the hands, and now the prophecy is about ready to begin hitting the fan because now the whole earth is going to have to stand before the one they rejected and give an account of why they rejected his voice. Let's read on. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art, uh, which was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. And thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in the temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. Guys, the moment that Jesus says, okay, that's it, you have had your time. Now the part of the gospel is taking the kingdom into all the earth. We're after the hearts of men, not the political structures of men. 
At this moment, the political structures and all the powers, I don't care if it's corporate power, I don't care if it's centralized bank power, I don't care if it's a power of the military, Jesus just grabbed it back and said, it's mine, and now it's going to have to answer to me, and right there, all hail just broke loose. That's what we begin seeing in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus taking back the nations. And all men have to give an account on either rejecting the voice of God through Messiah or accepting that voice to come into the kingdom. The writer of Hebrews tells us that there is a shaking coming. That everything that can be shaken will be shaken, but we are part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Why is the kingdom of God not shaken? Because it's the kingdom that's shaking everything else apart. As Almighty God takes his hand and wraps it around these nations and said, you will all answer to me. The time of calling has ended, and now you stand in judgment before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You were warned by Moses. You were warned by me. You were warned by my prophets you refuse to repent you refuse to submit to my authority and you're not citizens of my kingdom and so I'm taking back all the authority and power in the earth that's where we're headed I don't care what their technology is. I don't care how much watcher technology they use I don't care how powerful the Antichrist is he's a burp in the breeze compared to who Jesus is and even at the pinnacle of his power, he can't, he, his kingdom can't hold together more than three and a half years. It takes him three and a half to get it established. And he thinks he's rocking and rolling. And it begins to take a nosedive. When Jesus said, that's enough. Whose side are you on today? Whose side are all of us on? We need to examine. Do I need to repent because there's something that Jesus has been speaking to me that I have tried to suppress the voice of Messiah when I was warned by Moses not to? You see, walking in the kingdom is completely a yielded life. Yielded to his hands. The only way to win spiritual warfare is to surrender to the one. To the one who conquered hell and death. To the one who conquered the enemy. To the one who went about doing good, destroying all the works of the evil one. When I completely surrender to him, and then when he bids me to do a task, I can raise up in that authority, and I destroy hell everywhere I go, because his life was a pattern for how I'm supposed to live. That's moving in kingdom. Now when you understand that dynamic and you place it over the entire New Testament, everything makes sense. That's why when Paul went to Ephesus and he taught for three years and they had great revival, so much so that it began to affect the sales of idols. And it caused a riot of the pagans who began to demand, great is Diana, great is Diana. All the Gentile Christians refused to be a part of any of that. They would not buy the idols. They would not sacrifice into Diana because they served another king. They served another god. And what's interesting to me in the midst of all this is that Rome had no problems with Diana. Caesar didn't get mad when they were saying great is Diana because he was a part of the same system. But when believers said great is Yeshua of Nazareth, great is Yeshua HaMashiach, great is Jesus of Nazareth because he is that one that Almighty God said would come and speak his words and he was Almighty God in the flesh and he redeemed us and we're now part of a new kingdom that sets outside of all the 72 principalities and powers that rule this planet to include the prince of the power of the air. The day that I was born again, I died in that kingdom. And then I was resurrected into a new one. That does not come under the authority of the old one. Oh. But we've got to give an account. We've got to give an account. 
And the account is not about how big we build our ministry. The account is not how big we, we gather things on this earth. The account that we have to give before him is how much did we yield to the voice of the one that God sent. Come on. When we didn't, it's wood, hay, and stubble in our lives, the Apostle Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians. But what we miss... Can I share this? The gold, silver, and precious gems are the things that remain under the fire of God. Do you know why? All those are silver, gold, and precious jewels are made in the heart of the earth where there's fire and there's pressure. When I embrace the fire of God in this life to be sanctified, it creates gold, silver, and precious jewels, which was made out of the fire of God working in my life. And so when I get before Jesus, before the throne, and the fire of God falls, gold, silver, and precious jewels are at home in the fire. Now that's just good preaching. That's why they're so at home there. Wood, hay, and stubble, not so much. And, and the truth is, those things were supposed to have burnt off of our lives as we walked with Messiah while we were alive. What in the world are we doing carrying them to heaven with us? They were to burn, be burned up in the crucified life, in the sanctification process. But we have a church today that believes that you can hold membership without sanctification. That you can see the face of God without holiness. Why? Because our church has 20,000 members or our movement has 20 million members. It doesn't matter. If you, the Bible says no one can see God without holiness. And holiness, it has to be His holiness embedded in us because we were crucified and in that resurrected life, His holiness, His sanctification begin to manifest in us. And the more that I serve Him and yield to Him, the less of the other there is in my life. When I die... One of my goals is to where the only thing I want left of the world is maybe one piece of lint left in my pocket. I want when I get there, they just find Jesus. I would rather see it happen there and his righteousness established in me. The Apostle Paul kind of bows his head, in my opinion, when he said there's going to be some there that are left with nothing. Their lives meant nothing. That Jesus never did anything beyond salvation. And they violate the Torah. They get it, yeah, they get it, yeah, but they violated the Torah. You never come before the Lord empty handed. Boy, now doesn't that make sense in the judgment seat of Christ? The gold, the silver, and the precious jewels, we can then cast at his feet and say, Look what you did in my life. Look at the power of the cross in my life. Look at the power of your kingdom in my life. Look at the power of your word in my life. It caused me to change everything. And it caused me to be a citizen of the kingdom to work your will and your purpose in my life. That's why the Bible says that the righteous rejoice in judgment. You see, when I stand before the judgment seat of Christ... I want to have something that I can just sit and just applaud him. Just applaud him. And say, look what you've done. And I see the magnificence of your power because you did it in me. <laughs> as hard-headed as I am and as stubborn as I am, the gospel got through, that your word got through. And I fell in love so much with you that I lost love for the world and it, all, it took a God as big as you to get that done in a wretch like me oh it'll be a time that it's not a standing ovation it's an ovation that we get while we're on our knees before him that is worthy because when I stand before him my one heart's cry is, I heard you. I heard you. I yielded to you. I did exactly what Moses told me to do. 
I yielded and I listened and I lived according to that which you spoke. You're my master. You're my example. You're my template. And I live for you. I tell you what, I live for the one. I die for the one daily. Why? Because he's the only one that loved me enough to die for me. To die in my place. I'm crucified with Christ, the Apostle Paul said, but nevertheless I live. Yet it's not I. It's Messiah living in me. Because I've bowed my knee and I have chosen to hear his voice. And I have bowed to his authority. And I have been baptized into the authority that I can only get from him. Oh. If he's the king of the kingdom... The only way that you can move in kingdom authority is you better learn to bow before your sovereign. That's what the Apostle Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost. It's that kind of preaching that they would have 5,000 added one day, 2,000 the next, 4,000 the next. And we wonder today why nobody's getting saved. They're not being preached the gospel of the kingdom. It's bow the knee before the king. Oh. Well, Father, we thank you for your word today. Father, I thank you that it will not return to you void, but it will accomplish whereunto you have sent it. And Father, I ask that you would lead us into repentance in any area of our lives where we have not bowed the knee. And Father, I ask that we would completely yield to the authority of Messiah. Father, because only when we die in that symbolic baptism, we, in his authority, we come back out. Father, in the power of your spirit to enforce the kingdom in our lives and the lives around us. Father, let us be different. Let us be those that walk purely in your kingdom. That hell would quake when we enter a place because we walked in the kingdom of God came in with us in every situation we ask. Father, we thank you that you loved us so much that you made a way for us. You brought us into your kingdom. You saved us. You redeemed us. You cleansed us. And Father, you're empowering us to walk in your ways, to keep your commandments, and to make the enemy bow the knee everywhere we go. And Father, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name.